Welcome back everybody and thanks for all the kind comments. Today I want to discuss what I call the Antarctic refrigeration effect. And if you understand that you'll understand why the earth will remain in ice age mode for probably the next 200 million years. Now climate change is a huge and complex problem and it's akin to the the Indian East Indian parable that of the blind men characterizing an elephant. Unfortunately, there's one cadre of scientists who are trying to force a singular viewpoint, i.e. The, the carbon dioxide is the climate control norm. And once you understand how important ocean circulation is, you just might be convinced that the greenhouse gas effect is really the tail wagging the elephant. If you look at ancient climates, We'll see that 90 million years ago during the Cretaceous that the Earth's continents were warm from the polar region to the equator. The Antarctica was a tropical rainforest. It had its own dinosaurs, Glacialosaurus. Well, the dinosaurs had a major extinction event about 66 million years ago when an asteroid collided with the Earth and caused the extinction of about 75% of all the global species. So I'm going to skip ahead to the Eocene and the cooling trend that happened about 50 million years ago. Now temperatures back in the Arctic during the Eocene, the summer temperatures, even though it was, it was a polar place, was about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The coldest month only dropped down to just above freezing. Yet today we look at Ellesmere Island, which is adjacent to Greenland, and the average temperature there is about 2.3 degrees. So we've had a tremendous cooling trend since then. And along with that cooling trend was the development of polar glacial ice caps. Now we look at around 34 million years ago, Antarctica started to have its permanent ice cap. But then it took until about two and a half million years ago for a permanent ice cap to form on Greenland. Uh, so the question becomes, if CO2 is the control knob of temperature in ice formation, why is this this 15 to 30 million lag between Antarctic and Arctic ice cap formations? Now to understand the Earth's climate before the great global cooling trend began, we have to go back to the age of dinosaurs. Back then, the continents were all connected in one continuous continent known as Pangaea. With the lack of glaciers during the age of dinosaurs, there were higher sea levels, which created shallow coastal seas. And there was the creation of the Tethys Sea, another shallow sea. Shallow seas heat up more quickly and evaporate water more quickly. And that causes more warm, salty water to sink to the ocean floor. So at the beginning of the Eocene, the oceans of the world were dominated by warm, salty, deep water. The ocean's bottom waters were about 10 to 13 degrees warmer than they are today. And that warm water would also upwell around the Antarctic and be carried back to the equator by a current known as the Antarctic Intermediate Water. But that dynamic was about to change as Pangaea broke up throughout the age of dinosaurs and pretty soon Antarctica became isolated as it is today. When Antarctica separated from South America, Australia, and Tasmania, it allowed for one continuous current to loop around Antarctica known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it had had some major impacts on the world's climate. That current blocks the warm subtropical waters from entering Antarctica waters. That initiated extensive sea ice growth and glaciation. It also increased upwelling in diatom productivity, which is associated with the evolution of baleen whales that now were able to just filter feed through the ocean. And that tremendous productivity caused more CO2 sequestration, which caused the amount of CO2 to drop. And now the Antarctic Circumpolar Current through the Antarctic Intermediate Waters would feed all the rest of the world's oceans. In the Oligocene, lasting from 34 to 23 million years ago, 
the Antarctic circumpolar current deepened and strengthened. The formation of sea ice now caused cold brine rejected from that sea ice to sink to the bottom and replace the warm salty water. And that began to change the temperature profile of our oceans. Now due to the shape of the earth and its tilt of its axis, the sun more intensely heats the earth around the equator relative to the polar regions which receive more diffuse sunlight. So the polar regions don't heat up much and then due to the, the polar nights where there's no sun at all, it radiates all that heat back to space. The current temperatures in the polar regions are maintained by a flow of heat from the tropics into the polar regions through ocean currents and atmospheric currents uh, such as the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio Current. And we can see this illustrated here in this diagram where there's an excess amount of heat in the, the equator relative to its temperature. And that excess heat is transported to the polar regions which warm those regions. So based on those dynamics, I like to refer to the cooling that's been happening for the last 50 million years is the Antarctic refrigeration effect. Now a refrigerator has this compressor fan which removes heat from the refrigerator and blows it out the back. Now it's not quite analogous, but the polar regions radiate heat away through radiation due to the, the polar nights. Now if a refrigerator door is left open, then the heat that's blown out the back of the refrigerator just re-enters through the front, so there is no cooling. But if you shut the door, the refrigerator cools. And the Antarctic circumpolar current shuts the door on the Earth's temperature circulation. Now, as heat is blocked from entering the Antarctic southern waters, more extensive sea ice creates more brine ejection, which sinks to the bottom, and cold, salty brine replaces the warm, salty waters. Now, the formation of cold Antarctic bottom water sets the stage to create the profile of temperatures we see throughout the, the modern day oceans. We see that the bottom waters are dominated by Antarctic bottom waters. And that cold water helps feed uh, the Antarctic intermediate waters, which transports the, those cooler temperatures to the equator and into the Northern Hemisphere. And here's another way of looking at that profile. You have Antarctic bottom water on the bottom. You have North Atlantic deep water that's been formed in the Arctic under the cooler conditions today. We see the Antarctic intermediate water has flown up past the equator, and we still see the warming due to evaporation in sinking warm salty water is happening in the Mediterranean. And here's a picture of, of a profile of the Atlantic at about a thousand meters depth, and we see this warm salty water coming out of the Mediterranean Ocean. Now, the sinking Antarctic bottom water, which is the coldest water in the oceans, mixes and lowers the temperature of the North Atlantic deep water. And together, that feeds the cool Antarctic intermediate waters that moves towards the equator and affects most of the upwelling regions around the world. Now, by looking at the Pacific Ocean, we can appreciate the power of upwelled cold water to change the global temperature. During La Nina, warm waters are pushed over to the eastern side of the Pacific and cold waters rise from below to replace that warm water with cold water. If we look at satellite temperature data, we see the major drops in global temperature happen during La Nina events as represented by the red arrows. The problem is the Pacific cold water upwelling didn't begin until four million years ago, before the Arctic region began to form its glaciers and ice caps. And the reason for that is this Antarctic refrigeration effect had to build up the Antarctic bottom waters to a large enough volume to feed cold Ant Antarctic intermediate waters close enough to the surface to allow it to be upwelled and then affect the Earth's climate. Now around 2.5 million years ago, 
the Greenland's permanent ice cap took hold. And that correlates with the closing of the uh, Central American Seaway by the rise of the Panama Isthmus, connecting North America to South America. Now, some researchers say that this uh, blockage of the Central American Seaway uh, enabled uh, the glaciations to begin. Others say that it delayed the glaciation, and it, there's not enough time to talk about whether that's true or not. But the changes in ocean circulation around 2.5 million years ago were not just relegated to the Isthmus of Panama, but happened around the Bering Strait, happened around in Indonesia. So we see there was a tremendous change in circulation. Now, the one thing with the creation of the Panama Isthmus, it might be of interest, is it allowed the animal fauna between North and South America to move uh, upwards or southwards. If you look at the silhouettes in kind of the brownish green, those are all South American animals that moved into North America. And the silhouettes in blue are North American animals that moved into South America, which calls in the question if temperature has anything to do with these kind of migrations and extinctions of these fauna. To summarize 50 million years of global cooling, we start with the Eocene. A time period 50 million years ago when carbon dioxide was a uh, thousand parts per million or greater in the atmosphere. In global atmospheric temperatures, as well as warm, salty, deep water, was at least 23 degrees Fahrenheit warmer or 13 degrees centigrade warmer than today. By 34 million years ago in the Oligocene, Antarctica's circumpolar cu current was now blocking any kinds of flow of subtropical warm water from reaching Antarctica. And this caused three critical things. One, it allowed the initiation of Antarctica's permanent ice cap that persists to today. It had caused an extensive uh, sea ice to increase, which caused brine rejection, which added to the volume of the cold Antarctic bottom waters. And the current also increased upwelling it caused high productivity from diatoms, the evolution of the baleen whales, and that sequestered, that productivity sequestered more and more CO2, dropping CO2 down to levels of 300 uh, parts per million to 700, depending on your models, which is lower than today in many cases. And surprising, as the Oligocene proceeded, the late Oligocene was warming despite the continued drawdown of carbon dioxide. By the Miocene, uh, uh, the CO2 was down around 400 parts per million, and, but global temperatures were 7 degrees to 8 degrees centigrade, 14 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than today. And so some models said that, that CO2 had to be higher in order to justify those temperatures. But we could also say that the reason we saw this warming in the late Oligocene, or we saw it in the Miocene, as, as Antarctic bottom waters increasingly uh, replace warm, salty waters in the bottom of the ocean, it raised those ancient warm waters to near the surface where that warm water could ventilate its heat back to the atmosphere. By the Pliocene, which ended around 2.5 million years ago, we saw the initiation of Greenland's permanent ice cap that was partly associated with the Panama Isthmus, as well as other changes in uh, plate tectonics, which caused changes in ocean circulation. At that point, CO2 was again around 400 parts per million. And upwelling of warm water up until that point had kept temperatures around three degrees or 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. Now, the growing amount of cool upwelling waters caused the Pleistocene 2.5 million years ago to reach a point where it was very sensitive to any changes in energy imbalances on Earth. That caused the Earth's climate to fluctuate wildly between glacial cold periods and interglacial warm periods. We had the warm interglacial of the previous 100,000 years ago was warmer than today by about four to five degrees centigrade. And then the last glacial maximum temperature 
was down to about a minus 11 degrees centigrade colder than current temperatures. Now, these energy imbalances were, that the Earth was now very sensitive to were due to orbital changes, which could cause warmer summers and colder winters, to sunspot changes that caused greater or lesser solar heating. It had cloud cover that could block the sun and cause cooler temperatures, or less cloud cover that could raise the temperatures. And that's all a subcategory uh, of albedo changes, where not just cloud cover, but changes in ice and snow and vegetation can reflect more sunlight and cause more cooling. Sea ice insulation caused warm water that reached the Arctic Ocean to be trapped and not ventilate back out uh, to the atmosphere, causing temperatures to drop. Vegetation changes can change the amount of humidity in the air and the temperatures. Dryness changes also cause changes in temperature. And the ocean and atmospheric changes cause tremendous changes. The end of the last glacial maximum was correlated with an intrusion of warm water from the tropics reaching the Arctic Ocean and helping melt the sea ice, leading to the Holocene maximum temperatures. And last, and maybe least, are greenhouse effects. So you might be wondering if the bottom waters of the ocean are so cold now, how do we get warming in the Arctic? How do we get global warming? We'll stand by for the next video, which will look at how changes in Arctic Ocean ventilation biases the global average temperature. And until then, embrace scientist Thomas Huxley's sound advice, skepticism is the highest of duties, and blind faith is the one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science rarely presented by mainstream media, then please give it a like, press the share button, or copy the URL and send it to friends. Subscribe to my uh, YouTube video channel, or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, An Environmentalist's Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.